do with us and the patience that he's demonstrated in, uh, in helping us uh, connect with him better. Uh, I think that's what this is all about. And I don't know about your life, but I know in my life every day, I know that I, I need an extra dose of mercy. Uh, something just ain't working out the way you want it to work out. Amen. And uh, I always say church is uh, a place full of a bunch of bad people trying to be good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> if we keep that in mind, we're going to be okay. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks tonight for the mercies you bestow upon us, the greatest of which, Lord, was Christ Jesus, and that he, uh, through him, Lord, you saved us by his grace, his mercies. And we thank you for that, Lord, and we ask you tonight, uh, as your spirit indwells us, to uh, allow him again to be our teacher, and we allow him to be our teacher, to help us focus, to remove those contending thoughts, Lord, that cause us to sometimes wander off, that we may receive from you tonight that which we need. We pray and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, we left off on this seventh verse tonight. I, I'm, I'm sorry it's taken so long, but there's just so much in there that you cannot, um, you cannot just skip over it. Um, I, I haven't been able to, and I, I just want to share with you what the Lord is putting in my heart um, from this area. So let's focus again back on this Psalms 5, and if the Lord is uh, willing, perhaps we will, um, <clears throat> excuse me. We might uh, get to verse 12 tonight, but I don't make any promises. <laughs> Amen. Um, but as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in the fear will I worship towards thy holy temple. And we, we've looked at... Uh, uh, the other the parts of this tonight I want to start off by dealing with the uh, the the fear of you in worship pick it up from there um, David for David worship was not a fleshly uh, kind of display of, uh, of uh, out of control emotions you might say and too much of what we see today is simply that. Uh, worship is, is something that is done willfully, it is done consciously, and I must be focused if I'm going to worship. Uh, if I'm not conscious of what it is that is uh, taking over my body, if you will, then how do I know that's God doing that? And it, God is not trying to just, quote, take over take us over uh, in his presence he is trying to uh, transform us uh, and and worship is that privilege that we have and that God has given us through his mercy and of course uh, 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 by his grace so worship uh, is is that that thing in which God and man come together as one they come together as one. And he says, in the fear of the Lord, which says, here's how I enter into worship. And that encompasses what we talked about a little bit this morning in terms of uh, mercy. Uh, only the guilty uh, need mercy. Only the guilty can experience uh, that mercy. And uh, when we're guilty, we are in fear of judgment. <laughs> Amen. And so we cry out to God to have mercy on us to not execute judgment against us. So in the fear of God, in the fear of you, he says, I will worship. In doing this, there's a certain tension <clears throat> as, the, um, as the spirit experiences the presence of the Lord. And at the same time, 
we're still in this flesh experiencing the presence of the Lord. And there's this tension in that. Uh, the, the spirit is, is drawing close, but the sinful flesh is backing up. And, and, and there's that tension that comes about in, in really tr uh, true worship where those two dynamics never go away and won't go away until, you know, we are, of course, uh, uh, rid of this, this, this body of flesh. And it is a fear that recognizes the judgment of God because we're in the spirit, yes, and we can only do worship God in the spirit, but the flesh is, has not changed. My, my old sin nature, I'm, I'm to mortify the deeds of the flesh. It is still plaguing me, uh, causing me to uh, reach out to God and the power of his word to overcome that, that natural man. And so as I get closer to God, the natural man is still there. And there's this great tension then where I, I want to come, but I don't want to come. And there's this fear and this dread that comes over in that kind of experience. Amen. It is not a fear and a dread, however, that causes us to run from God in fear. Um, the, 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 the unrighteous do that. But we want to come, but we can't come. And, and again, you can sense that tension uh, all about us. A fear that comes when we experience the awesomeness of God. It's a high level of respect for who God is. I, I, I don't know if you've, uh, we, I'm so sure uh, many of us have experienced where we've had that moment where it's just a flash it's just a flash, if you will, where the presence of God is, is so much more real than, than at other times. And in that, that flash, there is a shivering and there's a joy at the same time. It's, it's, again, it's that tension uh, that is there. It's humbling then. Uh, it, it, mercy uh, only comes through a humble man, a humble person, because it's only the humble person who will acknowledge the, his own guilt and then reach out to God and ask him for forgiveness. So the more we experience the, 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 uh, God's presence, the greater is our fear before the Lord. The more we experience him because we're in this flesh. And we know that no flesh will glory in his presence. And yet he invites us to come. And, and, and we have to kind of balance that some kind of way. Moses trembled, for example. And I want to share a couple of these with us. He trembled <clears throat> and he withdrew himself in the presence of the Lord. But then the Lord says, come closer. Isn't that something? And so that's what God is doing with us the same. When Moses brought the children of Israel before the Lord, you remember at Mount Sinai, they trembled. They ran. Moses, you go ahead up there and you meet with him. But, you know, uh, we don't want to go, but we'll do everything you you, you know, he tells you, you, you tell us, and we'll do that, but we don't want to face God. It, it, it was a terrifying experience for, for them. When the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God, the priest could not stand to minister, and we know that is when the temple was built, and they, they brought all of the uh, uh, utensils, the, the ark, and all of that into the Holy of Holies, and the priest brought it in there. And after they brought it in, they came out and began to, um, to worship and to, to praise God. Um, they could not stand because the, the, the power of God came down. And it was an affirming power, however. It was an affirming power that says, you have set everything in order. And since the, everything is set in order, I, I'm, I'm going to come down. I can meet with you in this place. So what that really says about them is there was an obedience there was an obedience, and so God accepted that because they did exactly what God had told them to do and how they set that up and who was supposed to set that up, the sacrifices that would be needed by the priests before they would go set all of this up, the praise and the worship that preceded that. And then we find that the, the, the cloud comes down signifying God saying, I, I approve and accept your praise, and I accept your worship. And that's what we always want. We always want God to accept our, our worship. 
and uh, should be never satisfied if uh, we sense that he is not. Amen? When Jacob <clears throat> had awakened from his dream, remember where he saw the angels of God ascending and descending, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid, and he said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. He had seen this uh, Jacob's ladder, amen, uh, this, uh, the angels uh, ascending and descending, showing that the way of mercy, the way of grace, heaven was going to be open, uh, and, and, and Jacob was going to be a real part of that. Now, he's doing this in a dream, but he wakes up and he kind of finds out, you know, that's more than a dream. That was more than just a dream. In, that, in those days, God did uh, communicate with uh, his people, his prophets, uh, and others through the patriarchs, through dreams. We know that. They, uh, uh, Joseph and his dream. And so we, we know he did that. Not so sure he's doing that today because we have the word of God. Amen. And when we, when we uh, I, I'm not cutting off God and say he doesn't do that. But if he does do that, I'll guarantee you it has to be in accord with the scripture. Or, or we cannot say that this is the final revelation of God. Because when, Genesis, when uh, Revelation closes, that's it. So he's told us what's going to happen in the beginning. He's told us what's going to happen at the end. And so <clears throat> if... If, uh, if, that, if, if, if that dream does not coincide with Scripture directly, then, then God, that's not God uh, doing that. Amen? And we need to be very, very careful at that. The normal way that, that God uh, uh, reveals his word to us, and Jesus said it, when the Holy Ghost has come, he will lead you into all truth. Amen? He will lead you. How will he lead us? Because we say the scriptures are inspired. What do we mean by that? When we say the scriptures are inspired, it means that the Holy Spirit, and, and, and Peter defines it this way, it is the Holy Spirit who moved on certain men and they spoke exactly what God said without losing who they were, losing their senses, uh, or anything else. That's how we're able to distinguish between writers, uh, some of the writers in the, in, in the Bible. We say, well, that's Paul's style, or that's this person's style. You know, here, when uh, uh, sometimes we, when I'm, when I'm talking with some of the men, bringing them along, and I say, you know, I, I've got a certain way that I present things, but, you know, Johnny will come up in, he might, he might present something different, same word. And so God uses the person that he created and the distinctions that each of us have in our uniqueness to bring forth the word of God. And it is the Holy Spirit who moves on those men just as the Holy Spirit moves today if we let him to bring forth, but not in revelation, in illumination. In illumination. There are no more revelations. And anybody who is standing up saying that is, is, is simply a false prophet. There's no other way to say it. Amen. Uh, if God is still given revelation, then there's no check and balance. In other words, how do I know? How can I verify that if if I come and say to you, God gave me this? How do, how do you validate that? You don't. But if I say that th thus saith the Lord, you can go back to this word and find out did the Lord say that, and you can validate it. Did, did the word do what God said it would do when I received it, when I uh, 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 participated in it? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think it's exciting here because Jacob says, you know, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. I thought I was just having a dream. I didn't know it. He was in this very place. And so the reality of that comes, comes forth. And then we, we have another one I picked out is, is Manoah and his wife. You know, they wanted this child. And then the angel of the Lord came and spoke to his wife. And then his wife came and told Manoah. Manoah and then Manoah said, hey, you know, I, I want to come, come see me. The angel of the Lord, he said, I, I want to see this. And so the, the, the angel of the Lord comes down and he tells uh, Manoah and his wife, he says, you, you do me a sacrifice. So they do a sacrifice 
and the, the flames go up, and then comes down this figure in a flame that said, I am the Lord. And, 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 and so Manoah and his wife, what do they do? They fall to the ground in fear and in awe of who God is because they recognize, see, to worship God, I got to know God, and I got to acknowledge his presence. I don't, quote, feel I acknowledge his presence. Is he, if, if he is here and we believe is, I must acknowledge that. And God does something within us through the Holy Spirit to affirm and confirm that reality. Amen? And therefore, you know, that, that fear of the Lord kind of, kind of comes over us in this uh, time of uh, praise, of course, and worship. Isaiah shuddered when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. He said, woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He didn't see him because Jesus said nobody seen him, but he, he, he experienced the very presence of God, and it, it just wiped him out. He looked as if he was a dead man because he was in this flesh, and no flesh will glory in the presence of God. Woe is me. He looked at judgment, but what did God do? He had mercy. He took that hot coal, cleaned his lips up, and said, hey, you, you, you're all right right now. Amen. And, and, and Isaiah changes his tune. He says, now send me. Now say, I, I've been cleaned up. Go ahead and not, you can send me. Amen. He didn't clean himself up, but God had cleaned him, cleaned him up. When the apostle John saw one like the Son of Man, what did he do? He fell to his, his, uh, uh, at his feet as dead. Some say he died. He was so terrified at what he saw, he died. I don't know that he died because the scripture says it's like he died. But when he saw Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ in, in, in his glory, if you will, he, he, he couldn't take it because he's in the flesh. And yet God drew him in, didn't he? he laid his hand on him. He picked him up, and he opened up revelation to, to him. And because of him, we've got it today. We know what God's going to do. Amen. We know how he's going to do it. And it gives us motive to be more um, aggressive in getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out. We're too... Um, we're too much in trying to get our specific differences and doctrines out. We're trying to make proselytes instead of preach the gospel. Amen. Preach the gospel, get people uh, in touch with Jesus Christ, let Jesus Christ do the work in them. Amen. Instead of us trying to get them on, quote, our side or in my church, we ain't got no church. He's got a church. Amen. And Jesus Christ is still the head of that church. Amen. We know at Paul's conversion, when he, you know, he saw the bright light, he fell to the earth. How? Trembling and astonished. What's, what's interesting about that is there was an entourage with him, wasn't it? They didn't see nothing. I mean, they didn't experience all of that. But Paul did. They didn't hear the voice. Paul did. They thought maybe it was something other than, than a voice. And here's the thing about this fear. Even the devils, James tells us, trembles in his presence. Why have I went through that, 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 that short list? I went through it because you can't fake this. A lot of it's faked. People try to fake it today. And the, re the way you can tell it's faked, because, you know, when these folks entered into the presence of God, there was a radical, permanent change in their life. A radical, permanent change. We have con confined sometimes this presence of the, of, of the Lord uh, to the confines of the church, which is distorted worship, really. It's distorted worship, uh, which we'll get into in a minute. But um, here he's saying that, you know, I, I will fear you, Lord. I will not come to you in this casual lackadaisical manner. I will fear you, Lord. Um, I don't have to remind some of us on what just church used to be like. Now, I'm not one to go back and say them good old days because, boy, they were just as bad as these days. But there was a day 
when church honestly meant something to people. It even meant something to unsaved people. It meant something. They came and, and, and church doors were always open. Nobody locked a church. Anybody could come in. Anybody. And, and because they sensed the presence of the Lord. Isn't that something? Now we got to lock them and get security guards and security this and security that. But that shouldn't stop us from worshiping God. But if we don't have the fear of God, I'm here to tell you something. There ain't going to be no worship of God. Because when we do that in the flesh, we become a little bit too casual, a little bit too relaxed. We lose track of the tension, and we just give way to whatever spirit that is that wants to energize us. We take it on without any kind of knowledge of who that is or what it is. They all tremble then at the awe of the Lord. In every case, their lives were changed, I'll repeat it, and it was changed dramatically. Friends, hear that. That's how you can test it. You don't have to test it by what I'm saying today, but you can test it by Scripture. Every one of those folks who entered into the presence of God, their lives were changed permanently. Wow. You say, well, what about Samson? Let me tell you what. He cried out to the Lord, and I guess the greatest thing he did is in his own death. There's a change in there, amen? Now, if, if he didn't know the Lord, he, he, he would have no reference point to go back to. Everyone has, have been changed, amen? It cannot, and please hear this, you cannot fake this. It's a result of being in the presence of God. I can't conjure that up. I acknowledge his presence, and I give myself over to that presence. Not just here, but all week long, I'm, I'm giving myself over. Then when we come together, and we've all been just giving ourselves over, something exciting happens in here. And I, would, I will tell you, there are a few times in our life that that's really experienced. It's really experienced because uh, as, as, you will look, as we'll talk about when we get to worship is worship is participatory. Worship means that I'm, I'm, I'm participating with God as he is commanding me. I'm obeying him, if that's a better word to say. I'm obeying him every day because I adore him. Amen. We know that the fear of the Lord is to depart from sin. <sighs> And we know David always confessed his sins. We talked about it this morning that, you know, we should always come early enough to get into the church where we can come to the altar alone without all of the noise and everything else going on and quiet ourselves before the Lord and just spend some time confessing whatever sins we have, might have left over, if you will. Amen. Because we should, as soon as we sin, we should confess it. We should not get a, a bushel basket, put it in there, and say, well, I'll save them up till Sunday because then we'll forget uh, they're in the basket and leave the basket at home. The fear of the Lord, the Scripture tells us, and most of these are very familiar to us, but they, we, we have to redrill, don't we? The fear of the Lord is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord teaches one Wisdom. Wow. The fear of the Lord leads to life. The fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom and humility. Wherever there is the fear of the Lord, wisdom and humility will be there. Wisdom and humility will be there. Humility goes before honor. By fearing the Lord, that is reverencing him, Trusting in him, obeying him, serving him, worshiping him, a person learns wisdom. Uh, if we pray for wisdom, we're saying, Lord, put me on that train. Put me on that training track. It's not going to happen in an instant. It's going to happen at the point of contact. When I need wisdom on how to discern what is the right thing to do in a specific situation, does this thing honor God? Does it glorify God? 
is the fear of God in me that, that where I'm, I'm concerned about if I make the wrong decision, Lord, will it, will it hurt you? Will it hurt your reputation? Will it hurt the church, Lord Father? That's the fear of the Lord helping us to discern, helping us to seek God uh, more earnestly. Amen? I think in a lot of ways we've lost the fear of the Lord uh, in, in the overall church today because we're, we're stumbling over ourselves to make church relevant. I hear that so much. Uh, young people will say, and I think they get it from the old folks who are saying it, it's not relevant. You know why it ain't relevant? Because it ain't relevant to the old folk. <laughs> young folks say, hey, I don't see nothing different from how y'all living. It's, that's why it's not relevant. The word is relevant. As it, as it is written, it's relevant. I don't have to stand here and make it relevant. Now, we got to make the connections. We definitely got to make the connections. But to think this isn't relevant to today, boy, <laughs> that, that ushers away the fear of the Lord. I don't have anything to worry about then in my life about what the Bible says about this and that. Because if it's not relevant to my day and age, then I don't have anything to worry about. That's just how y'all think. No, we just gotta we just gotta get back to the word of God. We've lost that that little fear of God, haven't we? And we've become relaxed, not just in in our in our time and service, but at, when we're out and about, we we become relaxed, relaxed, relaxed. And so some of the decisions we make do not honor God whatsoever. And that's what we ought, to, we ought to be focused on. He says, I will fear you, amen, in fear, excuse me, in fear of you, I will worship you. So he's connecting the motive, if you will. I will fear you, in fear, I will worship you. I will not come to you in this casual uh, way that uh, others might uh, come to you. We are created, we are created worship beings. That's what we're, we're created, worship being. When we were created, humanity, in the image and the likeness of God, amen, we were created to worship him. Uh, no, n none of the, his other creation worships him. Oh, we can, we can meta, uh, speak more metaphorically that, you know, all the trees grow up even on the side of a mountain. And we use that to say even the trees worship him. And I guess we can, we can go there for a little bit as, 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 as uh, uh, kind of an example. But trees weren't made to worship God. You and I were. Why? Because we're the only ones that can. How can I worship him? I must, I must have the mind to worship him. I must acknowledge who he is. I must walk in his statutes. While worship can be spontaneous, in most cases, it involves the decision to worship. <laughs> that says a lot because I've heard people say to me, well, you know, I just can't get into that kind of music. What do you mean you can't get into that kind of music, see? Worship ain't about the kind of music you get into. Worship is a decision of whether he's worthy to be praised or not. And if he's worthy to be praised, it doesn't matter what the music is. Hello? Now, if we want to try to glorify God in the flesh, then the, then the music matters. If we need something external to pump us up, that's all in the flesh. That's all in the flesh. There's no fear of God in that. I need something that, that so my feelings can, can be elevated. And boy, we do a good job on doing that. We call them spiritual cheerleaders, a.k.a. praise teams. Not all. Not all. Church has become a spectator sport, and it should never be that. Part of, part of this series, and especially right here in Psalms 5, is, is trying to get 
uh, us in, in that mindset that, you know, church is, is more than me standing up here preaching. Church is the place I come where I can spend some time with God. You know, I spoke this morning about how we, we come and we want to fellowship with each other. God's sitting over in the corner. Says, anybody want to talk to me? The intent to come to meet with God. That's what worship is. The intent to come to meet with God. Not to meet with my neighbor. We can meet with our neighbor. There's times that we should do those kinds of things. But there ought to be in our mind this, this desire. I'm coming to meet with my God. And I'm not going to let anything distract me from that event. Worship. Worship is a decision that we have to make or we won't worship. We'll wait for something to happen externally and then we will try to... Uh, 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 put on our own worship, if you will. We'll try to manufacture something. Uh, most of those folks that I read off to us earlier about the fear of the Lord, I didn't see any of them jumping up and down and, and, and were very happy about that experience. They were very sober. They were very somber about that experience. Amen? Amen? Everybody wants to be happy. Well, the rejoicing happens afterwards. <laughs> Amen? The rejoicing happens afterwards. And sometimes it happens during the time. But you know, when that tension is there, I'm cautious of what I'm doing and who I'm doing it to. I'm giving God the glory. How am I do giving God the glory? I've got to give it to him the way he says. Worship fixes then our eyes on the Lord. And with this insatiable appetite and the, uh, to, to experience more and more of him, we don't have an appetite for what we already got. Amen? I know when my mom was alive, you go to her house and, boy, some of them old, 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 old ladies back in them days, you went to the house and, man, they, they'd lay out a whole table full of food. And you, you know, and it's just you. <laughs> And um, it'd be so much of it, you'd just get too full. You just didn't want any more. It looked good, and you just couldn't stuff any more down. You became satisfied. Amen? But you know, worship, I, I don't get satisfied. I want more. I want more of you, God. It's that appetite that says, I don't have. Amen? I don't have all of you yet. I'm not experiencing all you intended for me to experience of you. Not an experience. Difference. Not an experience. But Lord, I want to experience you. Well, what does that mean? You know, Wednesday we said, what is the it? What is the it? Lord, I want more of your righteousness. Wow. That's, that, that's different than an experience, ain't it? I, I, want, I want to be like you, Lord. I want to be like your son. I, I want to be conformed just like you're trying to make me. I want more of you. That's worship. That's worship. See, worship focuses us. If we see a slick car going down the street, you know, and we look at that thing and we say, man, that thing's nice, and we focus on that thing. And guess what? We see ourselves in it, all laid back sunglasses, Amen. We get to thinking about my friends and, boy, I tell you what, you know, when I pull up, man, they, you know, they're going to think this about me because I'm focused on that vehicle. It has consumed my thought. It has consumed my eyes, my desires. I want that thing, and it's taken over in a sense. But I remain focused, don't I, on that thing. Worship says, I want God. I want, I want more of you, Lord. And because I say I want more of you, it means I'm deficient. I don't have. That's why I, 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 it's an insatiable appetite. Jesus said, hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Amen? The mind of the true worshiper is on nothing but the awesomeness of God. As he is presented in scripture not as I allow my mind to wander off and imagine. 
Amen. God wants us to do it his way, and he'll make the connection. He'll come down and affirm, yes, yes, I accept that. We look at the Old Testament and we say, well, we don't have to do all that stuff. That's true. That is true. But God hadn't changed. He's still wanting himself to be known in his people. And if the Holy Ghost is in us, then <laughs> that's how he makes himself known to us. Amen? We all know what John 4, 24 says, uh, Jesus, where Jesus defines worship. He says it's in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. And he is a spirit, which means he cannot be worshipped in the flesh. Not possible. Right? I mean, that's what Jesus said. God's a spirit. And he must be worshipped in spirit and truth. So it's telling us that we, might, we, we must participate in this reality. What reality? The reality of the revealed word of God to us. That reality. In spirit means that I, my life is consumed. Spirit is life. It's not an experience, it's life. Does my, is my life true to, to, to the gospel that, that, that I'm preaching? Is my life true to that? In spirit and in truth. You know, he's telling this lady, hey, it's not about that building up here in Gerizim or, or down here in Jerusalem, you know. It is, it is here in spirit, life. That means if, if I'm going to worship God in spirit and truth, believe it or not, that's something I have to do before I get here. Amen? Because if it's not, then what I do here, I'm manufacturing. That's all I'm, I'm just manufacturing. I must, I must do this every day. Does my life manifest the life of Christ? And most of us would say no. No. And that's okay, because that ought to create a desire in us and a hunger and thirst in us, that insatiable appetite, Lord, I want more of you. I want more of you. And let him guide us. Let him lead us, if you will. Worship ought to then consume our life. David here is not in, in the temple. And he's talking about worshiping God. He's not in the temple. We've got to learn to worship God. And I'm going to speak to this in a moment because we are the temple. Amen? Yes. We carry it around with us every day. Worship is, before anything else, an act of humility. It's an act of contrition and a proud heart. And a stiff neck will never be able to worship the Lord. There's private worship. And I think that it's like private prayer. Uh, when we pray, we're worshiping God, are we not? When we read scripture, we're worshiping God. When we obey, we're worshiping God. We ought to acknowledge that. You're giving him thanks. Thank you for your mercies. I think sometimes we're afraid and going too far with God. Man, I just, you know, Lord, I can, go so, I can go so far with you, but after a while, this thing's going to start costing me something. People are going to start looking at me a little bit funny. Let me tell you something about those folks in the early church. Uh, that time is coming again, by the way, uh, and we see it today in the news. You know, if you became a Christian in the early church, it could cost you your job. You became a Christian in the early church, it could cost you your business. People wouldn't want to do business with you because of who you, just because of who you were. Product was good, price was great, but simply because you were a Christian. We hear about this fellow, that, uh, this couple, I'm, I'm not sure if it was two of them or whatever, that wouldn't bake some cake for some, some LGBT people, and, and boy, they got fined like crazy. I don't know if they recanted that or not. But we see that. We say, well, that's just one. Well, let me just tell you, there's more coming. 
Amen? Whatever you think about that, whatever we think about that, and however we want to debate that, it's reduced down to the fact that they claim to be Christians and that crossed the line for them. They stood on the line. Whether we agree with it, we can debate that. But that's what they did. And sometimes we stand back and we say, well, if I take it that far, it's going to cost me something. Well, it's about time it started costing us something. Because it cost him everything. If I'm going to worship God, it's got to cost me something. And the something that it's going to cost is me. That's what it's going to cost. It's going to cost me. That no matter what, no matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstances, I'm not going to bring this thing on me by being arrogant and spiritually prideful. I'm not going to bring it on me by being condemning and self-righteous. But I'm not going to back down from who I am either in my everyday life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to worship my God in both spirit and in truth because we're told to walk in the spirit and we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We're to walk in the spirit. I will walk in the spirit. And I will allow the, the, the Lord to use my life to show this world who Jesus Christ is. To show the world his mercies. Amen. Amen. He goes on, he says, I'm going to worship in your temple. I'm going to worship in fear of you, and I will worship toward your holy temple. David worshiped toward. Now, you have to understand that when they, uh, the, the temple was there, they, they would be out, and they would pray that if, if they were out and about, and, and they came up and, excuse me, had a need, they would have turned towards the temple, wherever they were, and, and pray. And God would hear them. It'd be just like them being in there. It's almost like Paul in, 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 in uh, Corinthians 5 when he, you know, he's chastising these folks. He says, you know, I, I'm not there, but in spirit, I'm already there. And so David is saying, I, I, in spirit, I, I'm in, I, I will worship you in the temple. I'm not there, but that's what I'm going to do. We've got to understand then what a temple is. A temple is a place where God and his covenant people Meet with God. I explained this this morning, so I won't go too far into it, but God says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So he's with us all the time. He's with us all the time. And yet he tells us to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the time grows near. There is a need for this right here, what we do. There's a real need for that because God has a a, his, his presence is more direct here than it is out there. Can you imagine if I was out there in Walmart parking lot doing what I'm doing right now? How many people be listening to me? If you were out there in the middle of the parking lot, I'm like, praise you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Somebody's going to call the state hospital. This is a special place where, we, you know, where God says, I, I want to meet with you. I want to commune with you in a special way, not in an isolated way that when I leave, he stays here. But in a special way, in a special way, amen? Paul has said it. Uh, Jesus has said it when he's talking about his body. He said they're going to take this, this, he's going to destroy this temple and he'll raise it, you know, in three days. He said he was talking about what? The temple of his body. Because Jesus Christ was what? Born of the Spirit. And therefore he says that Paul teaches, don't you know that you and the you here is not necessarily the individual. He's talking about you, the church. Amen. It includes the individual, but in this text he's talking about the church. That you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you. What is interesting here is that the early church met in houses, right? And pagan temples, even today, they, they look at them and look how elaborate they were. They were some beautiful places. In comparison, these little house churches, boy, they looked like little shambles, little just, you know, 
There wasn't much to them. And Paul says, wait a minute. Your temple is better because you are that temple. They can't build the temple that you are. See, they worship brick and mortar. But you are not just a worshiper. You are the temple where worship takes place. And if worship don't take place in the temple, it don't take place. Amen? Don't you know that you're the temple, uh, that God's temple? And then he goes on to say this. If any man defile the temple, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Boy, that comes into real conflict with once saved, always saved, doesn't it? <laughs> Better get our act together. Better get our act together. It's not enough just to believe that. But we've got to worship God in spirit and truth, participate, and make that a reality. Amen. Manifest that reality. Is it real? Is it true? Are we doers of the word? And doers is not necessarily, in this case, going out telling other people about Christ. It's about, am I a worshiper? Am I a doer of God's word? Amen? He says, look, if we look at the church in the you, then he's saying that the church should not allow sin in the camp. Because he says if any man, any individual, defile the temple, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. This is somewhat in concert with the, the teachings of Jesus, isn't it? He says, for within, from out of the heart of man comes evil intentions, fornications, thefts, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these things come from within and defiled file a person see a person can be sitting up in church and have some very ungodly thoughts and it's defiling the whole church I don't know that we can I hope we can grasp that I hope we can grasp see we're one body and I, I think uh, y'all in your uh, Sunday school uh, at this point of where you're talking about Achan, is that correct? You see, when Achan did what he did, nobody saw it. Amen? They were there in Jericho, and he did what he did. He, he, he took something, and nobody saw it. They got the victory, but then they tried to, they tried to put it in a can, say, man, oh, okay, we got the pattern now. We, got, we, got, we know how to do it. Let's go do it again, just like we did it over here. But God wasn't with them over there in AI. AI. And so when they got back, they, they were defeated. Why? Because one guy, one guy defiled all of Israel. Well, wait a minute. It, all of Israel wasn't there. The women and children wasn't there. Half the army wasn't there. One person was there. Friends, we are one in Christ Jesus. That's a reality. If I go and take a vacation, go halfway around the world and act a fool, it's going to affect right here. You don't have to know about it, but God knows about it. And boy, he'll, he'll expose it. But who's he going to expose it to? Those who are truly worshiping him. You see, here's, here's where the problem is. If we're not really worshiping him, I can go across the world and do all the dirt I want, come right on back here, put my little coat and tie on, keep right on preaching, and nothing's going to happen. That's why you see some, some places still going on. Oh, they opening up scripture, and they shouting it as loud as they can, and they got all the tricks of the, the trade going on. But if the Spirit of God ain't there, friends. If we're worshipers, God will not let sin Hidden sin 
remain in the camp. That's why we have to come in early and pray. Because when we come here, we're one. And we ought to be saying to ourselves, Lord, I don't want to be the one that sours this worship service today. I don't want to be that little clog in the vein that keeps the blood flowing, that keeps the blood from flowing. I don't want to be the showstopper, Lord. I don't want to sit here with my little secret sin, raising my hands up with everybody else, knowing. Lord, God, he's got to have mercy on us, don't he? That's why we ought to come and confess. That's why we ought to come get clean with God. See, we got to have the motive, the purpose is why, why am I here? I'm here to meet God. Everything else can go. Everything else can go. I'm here to meet God. And if I can experience his presence, that's good enough for me. We might say to ourselves, well, Brother Davis, now hold on here. You know, the Lord told Peter that uh, upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. Now you're talking about God destroying his church. That ain't what he said. <laughs> if this assembly becomes defiled and we don't take care of it, God will take it out. He didn't destroy his body, and the devil didn't do it. Most of the church's problems, I would say 99% of the church's problems, do not come from outside. They come from inside. They come from the fact that we no longer understand why we come here anymore. It is strange to say, come early and pray and confess. That's strange to us. It's strange. It used to not be strange. Folks used to come to church and, and it was just a quiet. No one would dare walk into that sanctuary with a lot of chitter chatter. Not I. I've got no place to bring us back to but God. You know, early on they had Israel had went into captivity and the temple got all destroyed and a bunch of them kind of got together and threw a, a temple up. And they rallied around that temple and they rejoiced around that temple. But then there were some of them old folks, they just cried and they just wept because they remembered the glory of the old temple. I don't want to go back to some place unless that place is the cross. I don't want to go back to some point in time by pointing out these things. We need to get back to the cross. That's when all of this makes sense to us. It doesn't make sense to us in any other context but that I come to worship God. I come to worship God, and I don't want to be the showstopper in any kind of way. Some folk will stay away from church because, well, I, I've got this problem and I've got that problem and, you know, I didn't do this. This is a house of mercy. Get on in here and get it right. God says that, that there's no sin he would not forgive. All sins might be forgiven. Even those that blaspheme his name. The only one that won't be forgiven is blaspheme of the Holy Ghost and there's nobody on the earth can commit that sin today. Not even possible. Are you with me? And so what David says here in verse 8 <clears throat> is what? Lead me, Lord. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. You know, when you're out there in that world, you got a lot of people working against you and, and a lot of temptations to, to, to wrap it up and let them have it. <laughs> Amen? And so we have to say, Lord, help me. I don't know how to make myself right. I don't know how to take what you've got here 
and make myself right. Lead me. And he says, I've given you the Holy Spirit, church. He will lead you into all truth. Amen. Sometimes the enemy is just, just snipping and nipping at our heels. And, boy, it's really easy just to strike back in anger. Sometimes we just got to hold that tongue, don't we? <laughs> Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Boy, I'll tell you what, the first time I read that, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I've been praying that for a long time. And as we study Psalms 5, I'm incorporating more of Psalms 5 into my prayers today. But I've always said, Lord, I need a clear path. I tell the Lord straight out, I said, Lord, you know, if you let me get through, I'm going. I need something to corral me, Lord, Father. And I'm doing it with all my heart. I believe I'm right, Lord, but I don't know that I'm right. Believing you're right and knowing you're right, two different things. You lead me, Lord. How many times have I in my Christian walk looked look back and, and saw some things I used to believe. I don't believe them no more because they weren't right. Lead me, Lord God. Because if you don't lead me, the song says, I will stray. There's just no doubt about it. I can't take this through my intellect and just kind of try to work it out. You lead me, teach me, and make my path clear as you're teaching me. He talks a little bit in 9 and about folks of the world. Verse 10. But then in verse 11 he says, But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defended them. Let those who, who love your name be joyful in you. You know there's a joy when we give ourselves to the Lord. I'm not talking about getting saved. I'm talking about actually giving ourselves to the Lord. When we go through that little trial and, and, and we're right at the point of just bailing out and we say to ourselves, oh no. This is, this is a training session I'm going through. And a big smile comes on our face. We say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I see what you're doing. Now, work it out in me. I ain't got it all figured out yet, but I know you're in it. Amen? Amen? That's where we find the joy. We don't find the joy in somebody sticking an ice pick in our, in our back. No, there ain't, there ain't no joy. <laughs> but when you recognize that when he stuck that ice pick in my, not, my, my back, I said, God bless you and not something else. <laughs> Amen? Now, that we can rejoice over. See, he done changed my tongue. He done changed my mind. And my, my cry, my scream is out to God. I said, thank you, Lord. I needed to know that the work you're doing in me is taking root. And unless that's, that ice pick gets in my back, I will never know. Because I know what used to come out of my mouth. But now something else comes out, Lord. Amen. Thank you. Are you with me tonight? And so we can rejoice in that. Verse 12 says, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. Wow. If God be for us, who can be against us? Hey, we, know the, we, know the, we know the rhetoric. We know the, we know the scriptures. We've got to hold on to those. That's worship. If, if God be for us, I don't like that word if, because he is. <laughs> it it kind of talks about doubt maybe, but there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. How do I know? Because the ice pick lets me know what's inside of me. And without it, I can deceive myself believing that it's in there when it ain't. So we thank God for that. If I wrap tonight, I'd like to wrap th this in, in this morning where we talked about mercy. <sighs> Let's not take God's mercy for granted. Let's once again regain, regain the fear of the Lord. And the evidence of that is how we live our life. 
Amen? Worship is a life devoted to God and surrendered to his awesomeness. Not something I conjure up in my mind, but the reality of his presence in and with me, in spirit and in truth. We all need the Lord to lead us, but we must be willing to be led. And finally, David says in 12, rejoice. I think if we, if we take this, I'm going to have to leave five. I don't want to leave it, but don't leave it in your mind. Don't leave it in your prayers. Read it over. Think about the things that God has done in these few weeks and how he's changed us just by looking at David's crying out to the Lord, his prayer to the Lord. Amen and meditate on it. Stand with us today.